Welcome to Shannon's Club TV, where we reflect on the legacy of classic cars from Australian roads and racetracks. We're enjoying your comments with each new episode, so keep them coming on the Shannon's Club website, where you can also catch up on past episodes. Still to come, we'll meet a proud owner of our feature car and get some market news from the Shannon's auctions team. Right now, let's take a look at the British small car, which followed a divergent path to that of its BMC mini nemesis, the Hillman Imp. As a car crazed boy, the Roots Group struck me as a weird name for an automotive corporation, perhaps the more so because its cars seemed humdrum. But something radical happened in 1963, the Hillman Imp. When the Imp arrived, Roots was on quite a roll, but this rear engine marvel this extreme piece of automotive design that almost made the Mini Minor seem like the new orthodoxy would prove to be the car to ruin roots. When it comes to the Hillman Imp, hindsight spells out a recipe for disaster. It was roots' first car of this size, its first with a rear engine, and it was to be built in an all new factory in Scotland by novice workers. What could possibly go wrong? Then there was the timing. By mid-1963, when it belatedly arrived, BMC's world beater had been on sale for the better part of four years. The Imp, like the Mini, sprung from the 1956-57 Suez Crisis. Mark, isn't it interesting that a car conceived as a fuel miser could have turned into such a racing weapon? Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? I mean, it enjoyed a lot of racing success, particularly in the UK in touring car racing. I think what, what I love about the Imp is under that sort of disarming exterior was a design that was a blank canvas, if you like, for enthusiasts all around the world to come up with the most incredible interpretations of this car. We had, uh, we've seen them with rotary engines out of Mazdas. We've seen high capacity motorcycle engines like Hayabusa engines. WRX engines. WRX engines. And we've even seen them with V8s, believe it or not, which is uh, one car I'll cover in a bit more detail later on. The Roots Board's insistence that the new baby Hillman should not be a cheap, no frills economy car allowed designers Mike Parks, who later drove Ferraris in F1 no less, and Tim Fry, both of them young guns, to choose the overhead camshaft aluminium alloy engine. At launch, the Imp was, to my knowledge, the only car in the world with an all-alloy engine, just 875cc's worth. Not bad for a tiny car. While utterly different from the Mini, the Imp was even more of a driver's car. It had a low centre of gravity and semi-trailing arm independent rear suspension. Clever packaging included an opening rear window which predated the hatchback and there was synchromesh on all four gears, unlike the Mini. But sales were dismal and reliability poor. There were Marks 2 and 3 with minor revisions and assorted spin-off models, including the GT. In summary, the Hillman Imp is one of those rare mainstream models that represents the triumph of the automotive imagination over corporate constraint. Mark, I don't know about you, but when I think of oddball races, the Imp is uh, right up there, top of mind. Yeah, well, I mean, if it has one thing in comparison with the classic Porsche 911, it's the fact that the engine was hanging out behind the rear axle line. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. The Hillman Imp, like the Mini, was a motorsport natural, even though its engineering attributes were diametrically opposed to its BMC nemesis, with rear engine rear wheel drive versus the Mini's front engine front wheel drive. The Imp's aluminium slant four engine created a low centre of gravity, which, combined with semi-trailing arm rear suspension and a light curb weight, resulted in a car that was competitive in both rallying and racing. The Imp's dominance of the British Touring Car Championship was undoubtedly its greatest achievement, winning the 1970, 71 and 72 titles. The Imp was also active down under, with future touring car champ and Bathurst winner Jim Richards honing his craft in a Sid Chrome backed example, which became one of the most feared tin tops in New Zealand. The Imp was also a common sight on Australian tracks in the 1960s, including several appearances in the annual Bathurst 500. John, if you had a choice of car for a tarmac rally, would it be the 998cc Mini Cooper or say the, the twin carb Imp GT? 
Well, as you know, Mark, I've never driven an imp, mm. but as one of those racing drivers, ex-racing drivers who prefers understeer to oversteer, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you without any doubt I'd have the... Uh, the Mini. The Mini, yeah, mm. absolutely. It's interesting, though, because even though the... The imp had the rear engine hanging out behind the rear axle line, which normally people talk about as becoming very tail happy if you if you get off the throttle in a corner. I've never read anything about that car in that vein, which which says a lot about the guys who designed it, because they really had a, an understanding of performance driving. Nevertheless, I do believe at the end it would oversteer, especially mm. with a with a sharp lift off the throttle. You think about how short the wheelbase. Yeah, twitchy. Arguably Australia's wildest Hillman imp and one of the craziest race cars ever conceived, was the infamous sports sedan built and raced by Harry LaFoe in the early 1970s. He replaced the tiny four-cylinder engine behind the rear axle with a thundering 4.9-litre small-block Ford V8 ahead of the axle. This mid-engine mongrel, with notoriously twitchy handling, had more than enough grunt to lift its front wheels clear off the deck under hard acceleration. It also left the start line like it had been fired out of a cannon, with top speeds of 140 miles per hour. Lafoe's bold mid-engine V8 concept was soon eclipsed by more sophisticated versions, including Brian Thompson's Volkswagen Fastback and Frank Gardner's definitive Chevrolet Corvair. Even so, Lafoe and his V8 imp were a big hit with race fans, impressed more by the sheer courage of building and racing such an insane concept than the number of races that it won. The humble Hillman Imp would never again reach such unprecedented heights of performance, and it was all thanks to the skill and daring of its free-thinking Aussie creator and driver, Harry LaFoe. Other great episodes of Shannon's Club TV are available to view anytime on the club website. My name is Ken Strange. This is a Hillman Imp GT 1968 model. The car was the average when I first uh, got it in Canberra. A bare body uh, restoration on it, paint job. It was probably one of the very first cars where the rear window lifted up and the back seats folded down, so it, effectively it's a prototype hatch. Engine was overhauled, gearbox was overhauled. It's a Coventry Climax designed 875cc overhead cam aluminium engine. This is a car that had four wheel independent suspension. As a young bloke, I had so much fun in these cars. The motor itself just doesn't realise how small it is, it, it will drive you anywhere. driving a four-speed, full-synchro gearbox. I'm obviously a bit of a toy collector. I have a collection of four imps. The van is very rare in this country. They were never brought out here by the uh, company. And I would imagine that there are about four in, in Australia. I am a Shannon's customer and I've found their service to be excellent. Um, never a problem. And uh, when I combine all the cars on the one policy, it, it makes it economical to have a policy like that. It's a, a quite an advanced car from 1963 when they first came out. They did compete at Bathurst and they're just absolute fun to drive. This car will be loved for many, many years and may even become part of the uh, inheritance. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon has dropped by to bring us up to speed on the Hillman Imp. Welcome to the show, mate. Hello, Mark. John. Hello, Chris. I'm slightly embarrassed to say I've never driven a mm. Hillman Imp. Me and too. Do you know what? I can't mm. even remember the last time I saw one. <laughs> I, I, I think it, yeah, that's a common occurrence. I, I uh, haven't seen one on the road for a number of years. Um, last one I actually saw was on a racetrack in a historic mm. racing. Yes. Um, but, you know, again, the survival rate of imps is very, very low. But I'll tell you what's interesting about that. When we ran a feature story on the Shannon's Club website, the oh, response from amazing. readership, you think of this car as a little sort of niche yep. thing that doesn't interest a lot of people. We got hundreds of responses. So. Yes. Uh, under that, you know, suspicion that no one's interested, there's a massive well, ground of interest. What that tells us, I think, and I'd like to know what 
what you mm, think about yeah. this, but it, it tells me that the more unusual and oddball a car is, the more passionately people follow yep. it. And yeah. the there may not be many of them. The imp is a classic, the imp is a classic yes. example. I, yeah. I mean, I remember my you know childhood seeing you know a number of imps on the road. They're everywhere. Yeah, you yeah. know the aunts had them, or yep. the you know exactly. the family members. That's owned right. Them. Um, but you know, in today's market, you really just don't see them. Mm. Uh, but you know, there are those enthusiastic owners. You know, as we've seen on the forums and have written up about it, that, that really have a real connection with it. And wouldn't the Imp GT be a desirable car? Yeah, yes, the twin, right. twin yeah. carburetor, that's, um, that'd be the one to go for if you could find oh, one. I think so, yeah, 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 that's right. They're an interesting car, though. They were badge engineered, you know, out of existence by the Roots Group. You had um, Sunbeam you know, Stiletto Comma, and Hillman uh, Chamois and yeah. Singer Sing Sing Chamois. Yeah. They yeah. had all sorts of different yeah. badges on them. But in Australia, we only had them as a helmet, which I guess simplifies things in terms of collectability. But it's a shame we didn't get some of those great models they had in the UK, particularly that fastback. That was a very right. good looking yeah. car. That was a very yeah. nice looking car, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So what's your advice for someone chasing a, a Hillman Imp? Look, I think it's, it's really, you know, getting in contact with the Hillman Car Club mm. uh, to, to probably source one because you don't even see them advertising the classifieds. There are Hillman um, Car Clubs? There, there would be Hillman Car Clubs in Australia, yes. Yeah. Yep. So mm. I think it's, it's trying to get hold of yes. the car clubs, but also then probably to try and ha get the support of a car club uh, in, in the ownership of the cars, and that's probably an important thing because mm. otherwise you don't see them on the open market and, and it's hard to know who to go to to, to get well, parts. And, well, you are talking about specialised care. I mean, you know, the yeah. fact that it had an all aluminium engine in mm. the 1960s. Yeah. Know, most garages just didn't know what sort of coolant to use in those no. engines. All these problems that emerged. Yeah. So no, that's right. you know, yeah. it, it, was, it was brilliant in its design in, in many ways, but when it came to practicality, I think it, it was probably its own worst enemy in terms mm. of people who were going to maintain. Yes, that's right. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I always loved the sound of the imp. Yeah. It just had a very interesting sound about it. Mm. Yeah. And it's obviously got a lot of charm, as I said. You know, behind the scenes, yes. there's a lot of enthusiasts. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today, no problem, Chris. Guys. And remember, you can get all the latest market updates on the Shannon's Club website. For your own lasting image of the Hillman imp in competition, visit the huge archive at autopix.com. Dot au. John, it's interesting looking back at the 60s, you know, when Chrysler bought out the Roots Group and they were assembling the, uh, the Hillman Imp in Melbourne. Chrysler wanted to add their name, but uh, it didn't quite fit very well, did it? Chrysler Roots Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I gather they didn't go ahead with it. No, Chrysler Roots Australia did not look good on the top of the building, so they didn't get away with that. It would have taken our attention away from the quite extraordinary Hillman Imp. <laughs> It was a pretty interesting car, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it sure was, and an amazing, uh, interesting period in Australian motoring history as well. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the truly unique Hillman Imp, and we hope you can join us next time for Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now. <laughs>